Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Kennedy. I'm the Veterans Advocate for Concord University. On behalf of the Student Veterans Association, we would like to welcome Mr. Grubb today. Uh, for those of y'all who haven't had the experience of seeing his photos and listening to his stories and stuff, this will be a good little event for you. Uh, Mr. Grubb was 18 years old. We, we actually share something here. He was 18 years old when he went overseas, and I was 18 year old, years old when I went overseas. And same location. He was in South Korea, and I went to South Korea. So I'm imagining over that 40-50 uh, year span, it probably changed a little bit. So listening to his stories was pretty interesting for me. So without we further, didn't win the war though. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, I'll turn it over to him, and he's going to show you his pictures and tell you some stories. Well, thank when you, you need to change the slide, just let me know. Uh, this is very informal. If you have questions or comments, I'll be glad to have them. Uh, I, <coughs> back here. Of course, I was with a 4th Infantry Division. It was a California division called up from World War II to bomb Pearl Harbor. In California, they sent them to California to uh, Hawaii, and they stayed over there two years, believing the Japanese may come back and bomb Hawaii. They stayed over there for two years. Finally, they left the Hawaiian Islands, got over the Pacific Islands when the combat started. That's when I got with them. Bad timing. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's the California National Guard. And uh, I was in the field artillery. Now, this is the insignia of the division, Sunburst Division. California people mostly, great guys, took me in when I was 18, shipped overseas like a parent, the parents to me. And uh, I was drafted July the 43, and the uh, war was over. I got out January the 9th, 46. And I served five years in the reserve. I didn't mean to. Somebody <laughs> <laughs> signed me the Korean War started. I'd been in Korea once, so I'm glad they didn't find me. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, and if you have any comments or questions, feel free now. This was the middle of the war, the beginning really. The Women's Service Club in Bluefield, a great, great group of women, they would meet the troop trains coming through Bluefield and serve the troops sandwiches while they changed crews. And they were very, my mother belonged to them, and uh, a lot of the mothers. And this is on Commerce Street, Clayton Motors. Okay. And now this is Federal Street, American Legion Drum and Bugle Corps. You've probably heard of them. As American Legion, they were known nationally as the Bluefield Group of the Legion Club, and that was a parade now. Okay, uh, this is the beginning of the war and people hadn't seen troops or military vehicles. These are the little, they brought a group in to show that's a little amphibian plant, uh, vehicle. I don't believe I'd want to ride it in the water, but uh, <laughs> I didn't have to, okay. And the people were very, this is on Commerce Street. Uh, and the people were very much interested, of course, especially the children. That's an amphibian vehicle, they ride water and land. Okay. Now uh, they brought troops in. So I say this is the early part of the war, and people were very interested. And they brought the military troops in. Uh, the Bluefield Post Office is on this side of the street over here to orient you. But uh, this created a lot of interest with the civilians, the early part of the war. But, 
And I uh, was raised on Princeton Avenue, and I would see war material being shipped through the yard here, going to Norfolk for overseas. This is a boat, amphibious boat, would go from a ship up on the beach. And uh, I've read those two or three times in different invasions. I rode one half of, one night around New Britain Island, and uh, the Japanese were reported coming down on our end from Rebal. And we rode that thing in the middle of the night, diesel smoke, and uh, we got on the boat and we found that some sea bees were there. But we never had bread since we'd been over there. And they had a bread bake and we were going to ride all night. They gave us a loaf of bread can of, of uh, sausages. meat, and we loaded up in bread and butter pickles <laughs> on that stuff, because we didn't know if we were going to get anything to eat when we landed. So we got so far out in the ocean at night and that diesel fuel, and we hit a little splash. We were loaded on top spray water and blood will stand and I was right at the edge of the water and I got so we got all about seasick shortly after. I didn't care if I rolled out in the ocean. <laughs> Luckily the Japanese weren't up for over the land. Okay. It's the one on the right on the right side. Okay. Oh, well, through the Bluefield Yard, we'd see all kinds of there's tanks coming through. They were going to Norfolk for overseas, okay? Okay. And there I am, right before graduation, 18 years old. Am I a hefty looking soldier? <laughs> <laughs> they were hard up. This is a sad picture. Uh, I was on the yearbook, took pictures, and we made this picture for the yearbook, Russell, Sumter, and Mitchell, and they were having their, they were going to war anyway, Japan by Berlin. But Russell Sumter was killed six months after that picture by Germany in the war. Real nice guy. That's, this is my older brother. He was in the Air Force on a B-24 bomber in Europe. But he made it home. Got shot up some, okay. And this is my twin brother and myself with our little bags when we were drafted going leaving for the military. And I wonder what my, my parents thought. We'd already buried two or three of our neighbor's kids from the war. And uh, my brother's been in, and the two of us left the nest. So I guess it got plenty of lonesome at home. There's a great soldier, <laughs> Six feet four, 150 pounds. I scared the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> this, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of things. In the meantime, I'd had my basic training, and my first assignment was New Britain Island in the South Pacific. It was near Rebal. And these are fresh graves when they, uh, they finished taking the island, but this is a sad situation. The natives built a chapel back here, and but of course those graves are later moved, by, I believe, to Hawaii, the National Cemetery, okay? These are the natives living for us. 
they built them off to the ground due to the animals and the jungle, and they, their family was there, okay. Uh, this, this is a little island off of our shore, and I so often want to swim out there. <laughs> Look at that white beach. Uh, our beaches were black because they were from volcanic ash. But I always want to get to that island, but I'm glad I didn't try. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the one in the middle. <laughs> 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 the natives, they were great guys. Now the women, the men wore cloth. The little girls wore grass. And the women, don't ask me why. But anyway, uh, the natives were great friends. The Japanese were mean to them, took their food, and, and they were glad to see us. Now that guy back there in the back, this is not a resort, okay? <laughs> should crop him out of there, okay. <laughs> and this is a modern mode of transportation, <laughs> caribou. Real slow animal, good disposition. They use them on the farm, and that wheel is a wooden, wooden wheel. That's how primitive things were over there. But the natives were glad to see us. And when they had a big festival. Don't ask me why or the name for us. And they get, collected bird feathers, made spears, and go ahead and get the next one. And now who he is, I don't know. <laughs> There's a drummy beat, and they really put on a show for us. I'm glad they were on our side. <laughs> Uh, this is the head guy. I, I said he's a head guru. Be my judge. <laughs> if any of you know who he is, let me know. But uh, they had a big festival for us. They were glad to see us. Spears and feathers, bird feathers, okay. And they had big rows of dancing. And it was, it was, I bet they had them. 200 natives there. I, I, I'd like to look that up and learn something. Okay. Look how many there were, and, and they invited our military group, and it was quite a festival. What we knew about it. Okay. Now here's a typical family in a group. They sit on the ground. Uh, raised the little children, and they seemed to be good parents. And but we had very little contact with the natives. Now the men would help us on some work duties, but the children and the women we we just pretty much ignored them for their interest. Yeah, you know, but they were. Okay, uh, here's three little girls. They have their beads on, their jewelry, just like you ladies do. <laughs> yeah. And their little tummies are malnutrition. Yeah, there's a, there's a dog or two. So, and they wove their own baskets. They had no plastic, no metal, and they were just lived off of the jungle. Okay? And here's a cut out, what do you call it? Tree. Boat, canoe, out of a log. And they just kept it from turning over. But they lived off of the sea in the jungle. There were no stores, no roads. Uh, just like the rest of us. Okay. Well, this is Main Street in our tent <laughs> when we weren't in combat. Okay, go ahead. We, there's six 
cards, folded up cards in each tent. They're about from here to that wall. And when we weren't in combat, that's what we lived in. That's Main Street there, that's the village. Very primitive. This, this is a waterfall from a volcano to way back in the jungles. And we'd bathe in it, it was warm and pretty pure water. But we, we had no water, we had to take pills out of streams, purify the water, uh, no electricity. Okay. Uh, here, the natives would love to, love to work and ride a truck. Okay. Now, uh, this is our kitchen and mess hall. This is a bag of water we purified with pills out of the jungle stream. It's got little nozzles you just drain out in your, mat, your canteen. As I said, we carried two canteens in the jungle because of the humidity and everything. And this is our, where we sit in the open, and our kitchen is here. We had some spring wire. This is where we were in combat. Okay, and this is your kitchen. <laughs> there I am with my mess kit. I yelled that for two and a half years. And how do we wash it? We took 50 gallon barrels of gasoline, cut them in half, put a burner under the bottom, heated them, and we'd wash our mess kit and the first was soap, soapy water, rinse, rinse, and rinse. That was our dishwasher. <laughs> Two years. And we had a barber shop. <laughs> uh, we had a couple of Mexican fellows in our outfit. You get so many men together, you have a cross section of everything. And we had a couple of them were barbers, clippers, no electricity, no shaving. But uh, the natives built us a little barber shop, bamboo. That look modern. <laughs> this is our theater. <laughs> How you like that? Wall to wall carpeting, good soft seats and boards. And that's a sheet on our screen in the little projector booth. We had a, no electricity, but we had a generator that was running the projector. And we'd been filmed from the army. Okay, so that was our contact with the outside world. But it, it was better than nothing. There I am in my chief. I, I don't know why, I don't look too intelligent there. Okay, <laughs> let's skip that. Now, this is the monkey. This is the monkey, and that's me. <laughs> Mixed up. <laughs> but we had a little monkey, and I saw a few dogs the natives had, but no cats. They probably ate the cats, and we left this monkey. I hope they didn't eat him. <laughs> Life is not easy. And we had to have some fun. Here's a lizard. And what we did, you have to generate your recreation fun over there. And one of the boys shot this lizard and nailed him to that tree. And we all left it there. We came back to our tents. And one of the boys said, look at that lizard. So the boys got their rifles and shot and shot. I know we killed him, but they had him nailed on the tree trunk. <laughs> had to create a little bit. Uh, here's, here's Hirschberg. 
He's the clown in our outfit. But we're a great group of guys. Some of them were pretty old. They'd been over there two years when they called them over when they bombed Pearl Harbor. Okay? There was Tommy Bugs Quez. Tommy passed away a few years ago. He's the one that pushed the shell up into the gun, built like a tank. And uh, he, every shell that fired our big gun, he puts it in there. And the work a great guy from Comfort, Texas. I don't know who that guy is. So, I wasn't overweight, was I? <laughs> I believe I went in weighing 150 pounds. I believe I came out weighing 150 pounds. But anyway, there's my tent. And the flaps on these tents, normally from here down would hang down. But in the tropics, we folded them out and put a little cot under them to make more room and got ventilation. And I'm doing the monsoon season. It rained like cats and dogs, 6 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock at night. But you can see barely my cot under there. But we, our cots, we had a mosquito net. We built out a bamboo frame to cover our cots at night. And we had no mattresses, those fold-up cots. My heel hit the stick on this end. My head was a stick on this end. But anyway, we slept on what extra clothes we had. That was our mattress. It's better than nothing. And then monsoon season, it rained like cats and dogs. This water had come down here, and we had a mosquito net, a frame built to keep the mosquitoes off of us at night. We had little bitty mosquitoes, they were a malaria type, and uh, we stuck that net under our clothes and we were protected from the mosquitoes. But it wasn't bad. All the rain dropping down by your bed, it's pretty good sleeping there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there's Hurstburg. Look how he treads us. <laughs> he was a clown. Our clown. Nice guy from Pennsylvania. And we had a volleyball net for some recreation. Okay? There I am with my brothers on a truck. The natives like, like to drive and ride a truck with them. Now, you all are too young. Joey Brown, the famous comedian, he was the Bob Hope in that era. And he came and entertained our troops. His son was killed six months before this. A lot of the stars would tour the troops and entertain them. And uh, his son was killed six months before this in the war, okay? He was quite a clown, and he was the Bob Hope in that era, okay? There's a DC-4, C-4 is in, uh, see this mat here? That was a steel mat, interlocked. The planes couldn't land on the coral it sink in, the tires would sink in. So they covered the runway with big steel mats the width of this roof. Heavy steel interlocked, and the planes wouldn't sink in. It sounded like a junkyard when they land. Okay. There's a little cut. We had the director of artillery fire over the enemy lines. Now, I, 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 I've had four of those airplanes surveilled here. I recovered two of them. But that's the little J3 Piper Cub, 65 horsepower engine. The pilot sits up here 
they observe what was back here, and they'd fly over the enemy line and direct the artillery fire on the Jap. Excuse me, Japanese. My daughter says we political like this word. Japanese. So uh, I wouldn't want to get shot down. That's fabric covered. I rebuilt two of those airplanes. Okay. That's my our artillery. That's me. This is a hundred and five millimeter Army Howitzer artillery. One of the most popular artillery guns in World War II. Still being used. And it would fire nine miles. And that projector weighed 46 pounds. And it would blow a hole up. And there's my gun crew. This is High Pockets. Everybody had a name. He's a big Kansas farm boy, tall and skinny, so he was high part. This is Bird, Tommy Bosquez. He put the shell up in the gun. He's from Cumber, Texas. And Cell was one of the crew members. But that thing would jar the ground. I lost my hearing. We didn't know what hearing aid was. That would shake the ground. Looks like my bones were showing. <laughs> but uh, here's one. Now the projectile, this much fire, weighed 23 pounds. When it hit the ground, things happened. <laughs> okay. There's Tommy Bosquez. It took a man to push that shell up in that gun. But he, he worked hard, okay? And there's Bird and Tommy, but look at their clothes. We didn't have a laundry map. <laughs> okay? Here they are. These are ready. These are the projectile, and this is the shell that fired. So you put this into there together and put the whole thing in the gun, and that blew the fire of the projectile out of the pallets of into the enemy territory. There it is, back in recoil. That barrel is normally up there, but they had to have a recoil to keep from blowing the barrel up the pressure. And then it was recoil. It's Tommy yeah, shell, that's why they're holding these ears. But we didn't have airplanes. Now we're loading to go to invade the Philippines on those camouflage. Look at our, here's a cot we slept on three and a half years. We pulled up cot when we weren't in combat. And this duck was big as a Greyhound bus. You loved your gun up in it, and it goes on a ship, and the ship comes close to shore, puts a ramp down. This goes down in the ramp, floats in the water, and dries up, floats up to the beach, and it's got wheels. It's like a Greyhound bus. But we were. We invaded Luzon. We had about eight of these on that big ship. And they'd been on a previous invasion of Guadalcanal. They'd been on the ship a month. It took a month to gather that many ships to invade the island of Luzon. Well, when we got to shore, opened the ship, and they started down the ramp. They'd been on a ship a month. The brakes failed on somebody. They're still going down in the ocean. Here's, here's where we're loading up. And we had a bulldozer with each gun to dig a pit surrounded by dirt when we're in combat. Place mortars or other artillery. 
sale committee protect the gun. And we used the bulldozer and that we're loading up some big loose. Now, there's another one up. And these shells would close, clam shell, and the ship would back out the ocean. It's a very popular ship. It rode like a bathtub. <laughs> but it worked. Now, how, how big that thing is. It had guns on top. Okay. There it is in the ocean, you can see the horizon. We loaded up on top and down under the bottom. You wonder how they floated. Okay. Is anybody here in the Navy? Mm -hmm. This is on every ship I was on. I don't know. And it's got a knife here and a cable. It hooks to the ship. I wonder if they floated that off to the side of the ship as they went to cut mines. But I can't find anybody that knows what that thing is. That's one of my things I want to know before I kick off. <laughs> okay? Uh, here we're in convoy. Out the Pacific. Going to Luzon, the big island in the Philippines. It took one, one month, four Army Division, Army Division, in Langan Gulf, one morning, Luzon Island, where Manila is, and the whole Pacific Fleet. It took a month to get that many ships together. This is Lingan Gulf, where we first landed. And look at the palm trees are blown down. <laughs> okay. There's our artillery gun dug in. We were bulldozer. We piled dirt up around the edge in case mortars come in. They protect the gun and the crew. We had nets, camouflage nets over the gun in case the airplane, aircraft came. It would be hard to see. But we had each battery, we had four guns, and we had three batteries. There's 12 of those guns firing at the same time in the heavy combat. Now here's actually the only picture I have for the Japanese are. See that white puff? That's a phosphor shell. You fire the artillery gun to see where it's going first. And it puts out that big white blast of gas. Of course, and there's, but you first fire and see where you're firing. And you've got an observer over where the Japanese are, and he brings the guns, you fire again, he'll tell them to come in closer. When they get on the target, they put high explosives in there. But that's a phosphorus shell. It'll burn metal. And the Japanese thought it was gas, and it scared them even more. I don't blame them. <laughs> Now these are back up. These are bags of white powder. I mean, not white powder, but our guns will fire nine miles over the infantry or infantry into the enemy lines. But if they're not firing nine miles, there's, each shell has five bags of powder in it. If you're not firing nine miles, you take some of the powder out because it'll make it go too far. But this is back to a mission, the bags we didn't use. Okay. Now, after we landed at Clark's Field on Luzon, the biggest Japanese 
right by in the South Pacific. Um, we, we took Clark Field on the big island of Luzon where Manila is. And we no more got the runway on these are C 47 troop transport. There's two rows of them. They came in there like flies. And the Japanese were up in a hill shooting at them as they landed. But they opened that base immediately because they needed to get troops supplies in. And that's that plane there, that first one. That's like Piedmont Airlines brought in Bluefield, C-47. Army had hundreds of thousands. These are P-38 fighter planes, one of the most popular Lockheed P-38s. See the machine guns? They came in right behind us, okay? And these would scare us on the front line. We'd be up with the Japanese front line. And here these P-38s come in three top level, strafing machine gun, drop a bomb right ahead of them. We marked the line with phosphorus shell. But we didn't know when they were coming. And boy, it scared us. Uh, let's really back up. These are extra fuel tanks. Flying over the Pacific, they needed all the fuel they could get. Single pilot, I don't know if I'd want to be sitting out over the Pacific 300 miles by myself, having fun. <laughs> okay. uh, here, each one of these Japanese flags is a plane that he shot down in the air. He shot down about 12 of them. There's the cockpit. There's the insignia of the plane. These are machine guns. That P-38 was on a great airplane. Now uh, this is a this is where the film got damaged. But this is a Catalina flying boat. The Navy had loads of these for patrol planes. Patrolling the islands, the oceans, the east coast, the west coast. Most of that plane would stay up almost 24 hours. And as amphibian, it could land in the water. But that one, uh, here's a bunch of stars. I don't know what that different mission. But the wheels would fold up, and this is like a boat. It's floating in the water. It's called the Catalina Flying Boat. There's Sally. This is a bomber B-17. See the machine guns? Popular bombers, World War II. But this happened to be a general's personal plane. Life is hard, isn't it? <laughs> Go ahead. He landed in Clark Field right after we got it open. And here's part of the crew. Now they had gunners up here, uh, gunner riding back here in the tail. There's a dog, I didn't see him. <laughs> but that's a, that and the B-24 bombers were the most popular bombers in World War II. But this happened to be a general landed here, and I believe it's his personal plane. Okay, there he is. Here's the gentleman. I didn't know him on a first name basis. <laughs> but that's a crew. And he, he went in a little smaller plane to go back in the territory. Okay, there he is. He had his own photographer. <laughs> That's a little stench in the L4 that he rode over the, wherever he was going. Okay. This is the Corsair F4U Navy fighter plane. Corsair 
He asked Corey that B-17 bomber, the general. He followed the general's plane to protect him and prevent him when the tank came by. Now this is the insignia, like a statue of Abraham, but it's on all the Filipino coin. So you can look it up in a book. I haven't researched it yet. <laughs> okay? Now, cemeteries are above ground because of water under the ground. And this is a, I don't know if it's a Japanese or a Chinese, but the Japanese went in all these and robbed the tomb to get the gold. And when things slowed down in Manila, a bunch of kids, we were 19 years old, and a Filipino dentist would cap your teeth. And that caught on with some of our young troops. They'd go get their teeth capped with gold. And you know where the gold came from. But imagine a kid, 18 years old, getting his front teeth, <laughs> whatever works, okay? Now this is a Manila. The whole place was level. Strategic bombing, World War II. And the worst battles we had were in the Zambales Mountains. Japanese knew that they were going to bomb Manila. They took everything out of Manila in the caves in the big mountains. They had machine shops up there. We got in one cave, found Dunlop tires shipped from the United States in a wooden case of ivory silk. They moved everything out of Manila. They had a machine shop. And our troops had lost more men getting them out of those caves than any place in the uh, Philippines. That's where they bombed. I want to see that, but we come to a cathedral here. Okay. San Sebastian Cathedral. That's the main cathedral of the Filipino Catholic Cathedral in the middle of Manila and the Air Force had orders not to bomb it. But they leveled everything but that. I thought that was great. And the Japanese didn't bother it either. The Pope had good connections there. <laughs> okay? The reason I don't have combat, things that slowed down in Manila, we got a weapons carrier, that's a small truck. Let's go tour Manila. Okay. And one of the boys found an ice plant. We hadn't seen ice since we left the States. Now, Manila was a pretty modern town. First civilization we got in. So we went to our mess trailer, got a aluminum pot, found a nice plant, got some ice, and the Red Cross got a gallon of Coca-Cola syrup from the Red Cross. We were going to have it to a manila. Well, we broke it up in a pot in our canteen cup, poured some syrup in it. We were having a ball. And had ice for two years. Anyway, we started down this street, okay? That's the market in Manila, it just started up, okay? The big pastime cockfights in the Philippines. That's one of their national sports. I don't know what okay? Here's Manila Bay. You've heard that, Corregidor and all that. 
uh, where the ships are sent. And uh, it just been a leap of it to take the ships on. Here's Japanese torpedoes in Manila Bay. Um, you can back up. I, I'd like to have had one of the propellers off of torpedoes. Hmm. Okay. There's a certain ship in a lighthouse. Okay. This is the back of line. That's a Catholic church on Penai Island. They didn't bomb that. Okay. Now I've talked to some Filipino doctor. He's from Bacalod. I showed him the picture here. Here's a kid. Here. Now here's when they first landed, okay. Now, fast forward, World War II had ended. They dropped the atom bombs, both of them. The greatest day of my life. We got orders to occupy South Korea. The Japanese controlled Korea 30 years before World War II. Now this is before the Korean War. And they surrendered and they uh, ordered our division to occupy Southern Korea to send the Japanese home. Well, we had summer clothes been in the islands two years. Our blood was thin. Korea has the same climate as Bluefield, West Virginia. And we, they gave us winter clothing, olive brown in our boots. We had to learn to march. We wanted to make a good impression. <laughs> we had to learn to march. So we go ahead and make Okay, here we're learning to march, like basic training, you know, okay? And that bay in Korea, there's a hospital ship. Beautiful. There's a destroyer. The Navy following us in, okay? Battleship. Aircraft. That's a baby aircraft. Here. Small plane. A few planes can land on that thing. I don't know if I'm going to be hit in the deck, okay? And here's a jump for the, the natives. And here's our welcome sign to the Navy, the Army, and the United States, and the Allied Forces. The Koreans were so glad to see us. They controlled Japan. The Japanese controlled Korea 30 years before World War II. And they sent us in there to send the Japanese home and turn the country over for okay? Here's the first white ladies we've seen in two years. <laughs> Who are they? <laughs> Navy nurses. We never seen a white lady in two years. They look good. <laughs> okay. Now, the Koreans were so glad to see her. They had the whole town there. And we just the first ones land, go ahead. They had streets full of little flags. Keep going. Here's, I guess, town officials if they had it. I don't know. Okay. And here's the Japanese dress. <coughs> senior citizen. Um, okay. And there's a band at the head of the truck for them. Okay. And the little Korean children. And that's a, I don't know what that building, but okay. Rice paddocks. And it's the same climate and terrain as West Virginia. 
We almost froze. That's the bay people want. Uh, Japanese air base people keep going. Naturally, if there's planes, I want to get to them. That's me. Great power in a Korean fire plane. Yeah, okay. There's a cockpit, but, uh, okay. Uh, those are going to be scrapped. Okay. Uh, these are new recruits who got in from the States. And I, to this day, worry about them because the Korean War came later. And I wonder if they got killed in the Korean War. Okay. There's a Japanese flag. A Japanese soldier had their own personal flag. And I have that one. And my son has it in California. And they have personal writings on it. He had it interpreted. And uh, he said the language wasn't very nice. <laughs> but uh, but we, uh, we occupied Korea. And the night we got into the town, we went in and just found out it was a college dormitory. We had a dormitory like they have here. And there's another one across the street. But we occupied it that night. Kept, we slept on the second floor, had our guards down to the first floor. And there's another building right across the road, a street from it. Well, the next morning, we found out the Japanese were occupying that building. But they got the message to behave. And we went up to the second floor. We never lived in a building or a house for two years, tents. And the jungle, and we occupied this college building dog. Went, went upstairs, and the, the beds, there's a shelf like this, coming out of here, all the way down the length of the room. And another one on this side, here was the aisle. And everybody slept here. Strong mattresses. No division. And we said, boy, we're going to get to sleep on a straw mat tonight. <laughs> a dry roof over our head. Well, we started bedding down. We left several down the door to guard it. But in about an hour and a half, fleas were all in the straw mat. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they're still alive. <laughs> Welcome to war. But uh, you could see my hair was dark then. I don't know what happened now. But uh, I have, we couldn't shoot combat stuff. Uh, they censored my pictures. All of my letter, our letters were censored. Right home, we couldn't tell where we were, where we were going, nothing to identify our outfit, and they kept my intelligence, kept my actual war pictures. I have a lot more, but this is all I can, uh, a general cross-section. But uh, I have a whole field full of Japanese fire planes, Clark Field, Manila, and the Philippines, and I love airplanes. Intelligence kept every one of them. But we couldn't tell where we were. Nothing. And because the centuries read all of our letters. letters. But anyway, this is a brief sketch of our, my military. But uh, a lot of stuff they kept, and I can't show. But, uh, 
Chris, if you have any questions, I'm open. How long did it take to get a letter? A month to two months. <clears throat> APO 40 was our Army Division. But see, we were on the move, different islands. And uh, oh, one other thing, my dad is a good, good grassman. And of course, my mother is a wonderful cook. So they decided to make me some cookies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the package gets smashed. But Dad put them in a cake pan and soldered the lid on. <laughs> you know, we're going but for about a month, I got it. Finally, got the lid off, and all the cookies had turned to powder. <laughs> I ate it anyway. <laughs> but uh, it's a great life. Uh, once is enough, and I'm sorry I can't show you more graphic pictures, but they kept. They Clark Field, all those jet fire planes. Well, I, I shot probably 50 airplanes. They kept every one of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shame on them. <laughs> <laughs> How were you able to get film? Uh, I took it with me. Now, this is the uh, 35 millimeter. It comes with a aluminum, little aluminum can with a lid and a cottage, and that's the way I could keep it, because humidity and moisture were ruin the film. But I'd shoot it and put it in that can. And uh, I had five rolls with me. And I've got other pictures. Maybe someday I'll get more, but uh, combat, no, they can't be the one. I saw a whole roll of fighter planes after me. Uh, uh, lost my best friend. But, uh, now, now, would you mind sharing the story of the, your toothache? Ma'am? Would, would you share the story of your toothache when you got there? Your toothache? Your toothache? Would you share that oh, story? Oh, yes. yes. I, I'd rather enjoy this story. Yeah, the toothache. You've heard that. Saying the Army's way, the right way, in the wrong way, which is right. I just gotten over the water canal with my outfit, and a feeling came out of my tooth, and the nerve was giving me a fit. I went to my sergeant. I told him, he said, well, I'll take you. We weren't in combat. He says, I'll take you to the dentist. Good, good deal. So we drove in a jeep under some palm trees. There was a chair and a dentist and his assistant. Well, there's no electricity, no water. How are you going to run a drill? You can get water down the street, but how do you turn a drill? His assistant. Bumped the bicycle wheel. <laughs> the right way, the wrong way in the army. Oh, they had a nature for everything. And they filled my tooth. <coughs> but, uh, when, Dad. when did you decide to become a professional photographer? Say again. When did you decide to become a professional photographer? I mean, those, those, what, what was it after the war? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> before the war. Before the war. My dad was one of the greatest men in the world. Worked on the railroad. He took Popper Mechanics Magazine. I'm way back. The kid. And told me how to develop a roll of film. He had one of those old fall cameras. He said, let's develop a roll of film. Well, the night, we closed the bathroom window under the door, 
total darkness, and ran the film to the different chemicals as instructed by the magazine. And the next morning, I hung it up and dried it. And that was magic. Out of the images. Uh -huh. There's old following camera. And we took it to the uptown to print the photo and they made print. Well, that did it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I was a photographer on the yearbook. And of course, I, I wish I could have kept my war prints. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, food was two years, two and a half years. Potatoes were petrified, little squares. The mess sergeant soak them in water and they'd swell up and he'd cook them. Uh, no fresh food, no ice cream, no coats, uh, two and a half years. And, uh, but we were all in the same boat. You live with what you have. And, uh, oh, we did get, yeah. We got word we we're going to get some fresh meat. We were near Lou, uh, 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 not Lou's, um, what's the big uh, Australia. New Zealand? No, near. Australia? Australia. My mind. We were near there, and mess started. We're going to get some fresh meat. Okay. He got it. And it was lamb time. <laughs> <laughs> And they had another celebration, and I got fresh chicken. And this GI decided to preserve it, so he buried it in the underground to keep it cool, but that didn't work. <laughs> and uh, it, it was interesting. When, uh, and little. Hershey bars, Hershey Tropica, Tropical Hershey bars with our box of rations, weight and foxhole. There's a little Hershey bar, tro Tropical Chocolate. You had to wrap it, it wouldn't melt in the heat, but it's like eating wax. <laughs> <laughs> and we had butter in the mess hall, in a can, we weren't hungry. You dip it, it, it was yellow, just like wax, but it tasted like butter. <laughs> Goodness. And, uh, but it's all, it's a different world. But, you know, I got to thinking not long ago, that food was nutritional. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't taste it good, but it was <laughs> And, uh, but, uh, and then uh, we didn't have coats, but we had powdered lemon, lemonade powder, mm. lemonade. That's better than nothing. And, uh, Tell about riding the troop ship. Riding the troop ship, oh. hanging, hanging the helmet. Yeah. Oh. Before you do, it's a troop ship. Been out in the ocean a week, you're half sick to start with. And you go through the channel line, it's a stainless steel tray. They slap your food in there as you go through the line. And you add shelves, not tables. You put your stainless steel tray here, and you stand here. But the ship is rocking, and your tray is sliding. You know, have seasick trying to eat. That went over real well. <laughs> Mr. Grubb, would you like some lights on now that the. Uh, what? Would you like some lights on now? Or keep well, it like I'm it okay. is? Okay. I got a few more. But if you have any questions, I, I have 
love to practice, but I can't sell you the restricted. And of course, they kept the good ones. Yeah. Thank you. Today, uh, if you don't mind on your way out, if you would just sign our guest book. We didn't have it when y'all came in, so just sign that on your way out. And um, we ask for your email address because we do a newsletter for the Veterans Association every month. And then any events that we have, we can send you an email. And then if you're interested in coming, you can come on out. But thank you all for coming today, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.